Welcome back, my crazy, obsessive viewers. Another episode of The Alarmist. And today I have a really special guest. He was the man who went and photographed the happenings in some of the greatest clubs of the 90s. Tunnel, the limelight, you name it. I mean, Peter Gation was a word and a name that we talked about all the time. And there were parties that we don't have anymore. And he captured it all on camera. He has a great book out called In the Limelight. This is a man who's been published in Vogue, the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Newsweek, Time Magazine, People, and Vanity Fair. And I can go on and on and on. Let's bring on Steve Eichner. Let's reminisce and walk down memory lane and talk about those great days. Hey, Steve, you like that intro? Yeah, but you can go on and on and on more. Just keep going. Am I on the payroll? Did you pay me to say that? Come on, that's better. Yeah. Well, it's so great well, to I be tell here. my viewers, this, this show is happening all because I decided to take a bike ride to Quag Beach. I was like feeling feisty and I got on my bike and all of a sudden I hear, Yo, Jesse, man, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and it certainly has, yes. But now, I was glad to see you by the beach relaxing, and I was in my happy place at the beach, so I'm glad we connected. No, it's great. And and you know what? we, the, the America needs us. New York needs us, man, <laughs> because those were the days. And right now, New York is a clusterfuck, and it needs to get fixed pretty quickly. So if it can't get remedied, Quickly, we're going to take people's minds off of the malaise and give them a taste of what life used to be like in New York. Now, for the viewers who don't know Steve Eichner, Steve Eichner was the photographer for every major club in New York during the 90s. He captured some of the most iconic people. He captured some of the most iconic fashion styles. He was there. He was a fly on the wall, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was Peter Gation's house photographer. And for anybody that doesn't know, Peter owned the Limelight, Palladium, Club USA, and Tunnel. And in the 90s, that was the era of the mega club. So these clubs were gigantic, cavernous. Um, it was a melting pot for creativity and culture. And, you know, you had your club kids and your DJs and your artists and your fashion designers, and there was no social media. So if you really wanted to get out there and get your brand out there and be part of the world, you had to go to the nightclubs and be involved and get yourself out there. You couldn't sit on your couch and do it from the basement. If you wanted to be any part of anything in New York, you had to be out in the clubs at night and experiencing it. And the limelight was one of the good. I mean, think about it, man. We did some pretty nasty shit in a church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's always a great thing. It's like the sacrilegious. I'm going to party this in a bad. church. Uh, I'm going to dry hump you in the corner here. I know we're in a church, but don't let that affect you. <laughs> and they cut the stained glass and the pews. And yeah, it was. Uh, and the VIP room, the famous VIP room, man. <laughs> you know, right right at the top of the club. It's like the, 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 there was a door there. I wonder, was it a door to hell or to the pearly gates? You know? <laughs> and then they brought in H.R. Geiger, who did Alien, and he decorated the room. So you had. All of these, you know, creatures crawling out of the woodwork. It was, yeah. It was a time to be and And uh, complete insanity. And, you know, there's a couple of words. There are a couple of words that are used to describe that time. Like extravagance, hedonism. The, to these two words are so far from the reality of what we have now. Talk mm -hmm. about that. Well, yeah, I mean, most recently before the pandemic, it was all about your your bottle service and your VIP rooms. And so back in the day of the limelight and, and the mega clubs, it really was more what can you bring to the party? What can you add to the party? And, and it was trying to include everybody. So you had Wall Street guys in shoot, suits and ties you know, dancing with drag queens and transvestites. And it was all about exploring your sexuality and your- And there was no Me Too movement or no woke mentality and none of all this BS that's been going on. You know, you have, like you just said, 
bankers and drag queens, rockers yeah. and lesbians. You know, it, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Yeah, I mean, that was Peter's whole mentality was like it was like two sides of a magnet, positive and negative, and those forces pushing each other around the club. You know, as Peter said in his autobiography, you know, I it's boring to have all of the same people in a club. You need that diversity of culture to really make that vibration happen. And we and weren't a self-conscious, we weren't self-conscious. And I think right now we're so afraid about being videotaped or what we say to somebody, you know, this is what's so refreshing when you and I met, you know, reconnected the other day, we just shot the breeze. We didn't worry about if I was going to offend you, you're going to offend me. We just, yeah. we, uh, you know, your, your friend had to pull you away. It's like, Steve, I want to go home. <laughs> yeah, know? I mean, in those days, you were present. There wasn't a yeah. cell phone to distract you. So if there was a fashion show, the music stopped and everyone looked at the fashion show. No one was filming it and doing selfies. And then, you know, if the DJ put on a great tune, everyone danced to it. So you were present and you were in the moment and you weren't worried about your, your image being captured secretly. And part of the beauty of my book was I was the window onto the world f up for these clubs. There weren't cameras everywhere. There weren't people, you know, documenting and videotaping everything. So it was a much different era. And you're right, people are are much more self-conscious now, image conscious, and um, everyone then just let it loose. Yeah, we were able to relax because we knew nobody was filming us. And any selfie, you'd have to wait a full 24 hours to <laughs> see it in the paper or in the next day, you know what I mean, or on TV. Now, one of the things that was really great about that era is the over-the-top costumes, you know? You had, you know, here, here we're talking about bankers and drag queens. You had glitterati, you had confetti, you had sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and you had nonstop dancing. And I, you know, we don't have that. Even, you know, my wife is like, I just want to go out and dance. You know, we don't do that anymore, and we need to. Yeah, we do. And, you know, in the 90s, we had the club kids and that was like almost like a circus atmosphere. They Richie were, Rich. Richie Rich and Michael Alec and, and uh, Genitalia and, and all of the, the, the really Denise's and Screaming Rachel's and even RuPaul was part of that. RuPaul came up in the club kids era and yeah. Bunny. And so um, and that was all about walking up to the door of the club and, and the velvet rope opening and saying, hey, I'm here. I have something to add. This is my artistic, creative expression. And every night it was, you know, like lipstick is eyeshadow and cotton candy hair and, you know, four foot tall platform form shoes and, you know, uh, fishnet stockings over my face and ping pong balls in my eyes and whatever you don't could stop, do. Don't stop, Steve. Don't stop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, and so there's a funny picture in my book. This, man. There's a funny picture in my book. I call it What Not to Wear to Get into a Club. And it's a bunch of guys <laughs> tell us, tell down us, shirts and khakis. Yeah. <laughs> so they're like wearing khakis and button down shirts and a picture it's a picture looking from the doorman's perspective looking out like so yeah so <laughs> the doorman's people... probably saying this, this guy's <laughs> not getting in sorry <laughs> and then it was dancing i mean it was and then there was you know the crazy drug use which we can't forget and the ex sexual exploration oh. and it was you know it was really a time that you know i'm so glad i was able to document because, you know, the book I look as like an archaeological dig, those slides and negatives were sitting in file cabinets for 30 years. Wow. I, after I shot for Peter, I went on to work for Women's Wear Daily as a staff photographer. So when uh, Gabriel Sanchez came to me from BuzzFeed and wanted to do an article about my photos from the 90s, the craziest photos, you know, one of those BuzzFeed things. And then we got together and partnered up and he wrote the book and I, you know, it's a photography book, but he wrote the copy, you know, and then finally we got a book deal and we were able to look through the files and with a purpose and dig out these, you know, and, and the colors were so vibrant and just rediscovering all of the people, Tupac Shakur and Madonna and then, you know, the club kids, like we talked about before and, you know, the, the musicians and, and then the, the backgrounds and the artists and the fashion. It was just, you know, it was just so exciting.
Now, now, Peter Gation has always been sort of a mystery man, you know, with the patch over his eye. We never really saw Peter much, you know. Talk yeah. about Peter Gation, because I think a lot of people, they know his name, maybe. They, mm -hmm. they know the image, but they don't know the man. Yeah, I mean, he was a genius mastermind. Of How old was he been when he was when he started to run the the, the line? I think he was in his thirties. He wow. we started in Canada with a small club, and then he opened a limelight in I believe in uh, Atlanta, and then in Florida, and then New York. And uh, so he started the limelight brand. But when he was in Canada, it was always his dream to make his mark in New York, wow. and he employed so many people and in every walk of life in New York City of creativity. You know, you have to think of the lighting and the DJs and he always wanted the best of the best. And you never knew when you walked into a club I had, that you could have been there yesterday and you come the next day and it's completely different with art installations. He took the bathroom and he made it the entrance way. Or, you know, <laughs> He would, How you know, many people could get away with that now? To get into the club. And, you know, nobody nobody could turn the, the, the entrance to the toilet as the entrance to a club now. You'd be put away, you know. You'd be called a pervert or something like that, you know. <laughs> and he brought on promoters that came up with original ideas for for uh, shows and events. And, 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 you know, you had Disco 2000 Night and the Rock and Roll Church at the Limelight. And, you know, he was the first venue in New York at the tunnel that had a hip hop night and nobody wanted to touch hip hop in those days because you needed metal detectors. And it was, you know, it was a little bit scary and dangerous because it was on the fringes of culture and, and music and he embraced it and he brought in Grandmaster Flash and they had a, the Sunday, I mean, the tunnel Sundays with, with hip hop, hip hop night. Uh, and so he, he was the first, he was the first really to embrace it, I think. Right. But he stayed in the background. He didn't want to be in the limelight. Right. He didn't want to be out there. And he was all business. You know, he said, you know, the, the real business of club, uh, the real club business happens during the daytime, not at night. Right. So he was bringing in the best of the best to do. Um, you know, all of the behind the scenes work. And, and then he expanded it. He got the Palladium, which was, I saw some amazing bands there. Yeah. Genesis and you know, uh, the old Genesis. Prince, Peter Prince Gabriel. played at the, at the Palladium. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and then I, he I, I was even in an altercation <laughs> at the Palladium. I had gone on the Morton Downey Jr. show and I did a two part episode, <laughs> Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. And I'm sitting with Polygram President Peter Asher watching Banana Rama. And in the corner of my eye, I see these two guys like whispering to each other with a huge pint, a huge tall glass of beer. And I'm going to myself, those motherfuckers, they're going to throw that beer at me. So I ducked, but Peter didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and arrest on the spot. I said, I guess I'm getting my 15 minutes of fame. But that was the thing, you know. There was it was no holds barred. Anything goes, and that was what made it great. And that's what makes music great when you don't have to think about who you're writing for. You just write what's on your mind. You just put a pen to paper, and you just do it. You know. And now, oh my God, it, it, it's 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 impossible. I don't know how people date. How do they date now? They, yeah, they date online. I mean, it's it's another online one where, where people lie know. all the time. And put a picture that's 20 years old and they go, oh, yeah, baby, come on and see me. Meanwhile, she's grandma. She can't find her fucking teeth. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've met all the celebs. So I want to I want to mention like four or five of them. The first one I'm going to mention is I used to be on her show, Joan Rivers. Yes. I love Joan. Yeah. The funny thing is, is when Joan was on the air, she was, you know, she was tart and she was you know a little abrasive but especially when she had her daytime show she was not the person when the when the when, when the mic went off it was fuck this fuck that oh my god and i'll never forget i was the first journalist to go on a guest i guess to go on her show and i started doing stand-up with her mm -hmm. i would present my gossip and i would make jokes about them and i would feed her the lines so mm -hmm. she loved it so she bounced back and for like 15 minutes, we were going back and forth. I would tell my, my gossip stories and she would be ranking on them. And then they would go to commercial and the producers came out. 
Nobody does that with Joan. Nobody. And Joan <laughs> just grabbed the producer by the arm and says, get the fuck out of here. This guy is the most refreshing guy I've had on my show in, in, in months. You need to learn from him. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but so you there's a photo the here. Right there's a photo here, and we'll flash it, I guess, at some point, but of Joan Rivers, and it was her birthday party. And the funny story, you would have loved this as a gossip columnist at the time. Um, so they had these guys with no shirts on, like muscle built beefcake guys, and they carried her out to, you know, to, to blow her cake out, to blow the candles out for, for her cake. And I took these photos of her, these guys, and they're carrying her, and she blows the cake out, and everyone sings happy birthday. And so I'm like, these are great. These are going to run everywhere. And she comes over, to, excuse me. Um, my husband Edgar won't like those pictures. Can you not publish those, please? <laughs> <laughs> Just use the one without the guys carrying me. And I was like, god. that's the money shot. <laughs> oh my god, it is a fucking money shot. Oh my yeah. god, Edgar. I remember Edgar. Oh my god. Yeah, but she was great. She had a great sense of humor and she was she, she, you know what? She was, you know, I remember I had a hard time getting into a club one night and I didn't realize she was standing behind me and this bouncer wouldn't let me in and she got in front of me she says you know who this guy is he's on my show every week you let him in i mean nobody does that i had, I had a major fucking celebrity standing up for me that you know forget it we don't have this camaraderie anymore we don't have this just this great spirit of of, of what's coming next you know she actually let me co-produce a show for her i did a show with stephen wow. lewis with um uh the one who used to do uh oh the, uh, stephen lewis I can't remember the other guys, but it was behind the velvet ropes. It was a whole club show. It was, she couldn't give me producer's credit because I wasn't in the union, but she let me creatively put it all together. And it was amazing. It yeah. was amazing. The woman who owned Iguana, who was that? She died. Um, oh, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, she was with Iguana and Stephen Lewis was doing parties. And I had mm -hmm. one guy, I forgot his name. He was a coke addict from, from some club. And everybody was telling their stories. And it was a great, great show, you know, and you would never get that raw, you know, that rawness that, that we had back then, you know. Um, talk about Leonardo DiCaprio. I remember when he was just 17, 18, and he was with, every time I would run into him, he would be with another babe. And I'm like, you know, I, I said, you got to use protection, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, <laughs> there's a picture of him in the book when he was like 15 or 16. It was just after Gilbert Grape. And it was, uh, if you remember the movie Red Rock West yep. um, with Dennis Hopper. I love that. So it was an after party at Club USA. And you know, remember those old after parties, like you said, back in the day, everyone was free. There wasn't control. There weren't publicists telling you, take this shot, don't take that shot. Everyone roamed around. They drank. We got those funny, ah, fun, fun, fun party pictures. So I'm... Um, doing my thing and I'm taking pictures of Dennis Hopper. And then, you know, I see Leonardo and in those years you could smoke cigarettes in the club. So they had cigarette girls that had candy and they were very colorfully dressed. And I saw Leo over there and he was buying something. I guess I thought candy. I'm like, this is cute. Look at the cute kid buying candy. So I snap a picture. <laughs> Like a and, Gilbert Grape yeah. buying a Nestle's a chocolate bar. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't digital, so I couldn't see it. I just snap a picture, you know, right. and it's dark in there. And, right, right. and I'm going about my business, and I tap on my shoulder, and it was another one of these, hey, can you do me a favor? And I'm like, sure, what? You know, he's like, that picture, please just don't don't publish it. He was like, and he's oh. notoriously bad about hating paparazzi and photographers oh my and God. not taking pictures. And he said to me, Listen, you can take my picture all night long. I'll do I'll pose, I'll do anything. Just don't publish that picture. So there's a picture of him and Dennis Hopper mugging it up for me in the book, which I'm very proud of because he never really likes to pose for pictures. And the night wore on and I asked him, I'm not gonna use that picture, just can you tell me why? Yeah, yeah, good he question. Said, well, I was buying cigarettes and I don't want my mom to see <laughs> I'm smoking and buying cigarettes. So. Oh my God, he didn't want to. <laughs> so I did. Money. I buried the picture and I didn't, you know, publish it for years and years after that. But That's great. Dennis Hopper was great. I, I, I got to meet Dennis with his last wife, Vicky, when they were in love in, uh -oh. in, in, uh, in Montego Bay in Ocho Rios in Jamaica. There yeah. was a guy named Marjo Gortner. He used to be an evangelist who did all these 
these celebrity uh, fundraisers for the Ocean Society with Ted Danson and Mary Steenberg. And so, you know, I got invited down, you know, it was Butch Stewart and Sandals and they didn't have a, a guy representing their interests. They had all the paparazzi that Marjorie brought down. So I was the guy. And, <laughs> you know, Dennis comes in and, and Butch introduces me to Dennis. And I'm like, I'm sitting here with one of my fucking heroes, you know, and <laughs> he was great. And, and you know what? I actually got in the middle I ended up spending time with Peter Fonda a little bit after Peter showed up to New York and mm -hmm. stayed at the palace. And I, uh, I had a, a dinner. We were supposed to come to, you know, he was, we were supposed to go at Le Cirque. Syrio would always hook me up when mm -hmm. I would bring a celeb to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. He would like fucking pull out the, the, all the stops. So I said, I'm bringing, I'm bringing Peter Fonda tonight. And he sees Peter and he just jumps out of his chair. <laughs> and meanwhile, Peter tells me how he fucking hates Dennis, how they haven't <laughs> talked in years. And I got him at that dinner to call him you know, from the, they had no cell phones back then, you know, it was the beginning of that flip phone mentality right. and got them on the phone and they finally reconciled, you know, but, you know, but you don't get that now. We would never get that now. Yeah. Now, now yeah. you got to, did you get to know Tupac Shakur at all? I didn't really get to know him. I photographed him twice at the clubs and, you know, he was a ball of energy. I just remember him being so fun and happy and he was bopping around the clubs and um, posed for pictures, super nice. But I did get this one kind of, uh, I would say, eerie shot of him doing this. He, um, yeah, there's a shot I have of him and he's looking. You have looking a photo? You can send like that to Noah? Like, hmm? Could you send that picture to Noah? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't. I just I discovered it when in looking through all of my old photos wow. and like I, you know, he was kind of a group shot and he's doing this in the wow. shot and looking right in the camera and it was very ominous and um, so I didn't get to know him but I really did appreciate him and his music and I I saw him as a really positive person when I did encounter him in the clubs. Now you also photographed Madonna a lot. Um, this is the Jelly Bean Benitez days, man. I remember, yeah. remember him. He's I do, yeah. Probably a shoe yeah. salesman in Iowa, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he, she was a piece of work. She, believe it or not, you know, I pursued a music career for a little while as an artist, and I had a loft at Five Eighty Four Eighth Avenue. Vernon Reed and Living Color and my band used to share the same loft, and our neighbor was T M Stevens, and on the other side. Madonna. <laughs> and wow. Madonna, before anybody knew who she was, used to come into my studio all the fucking time. Oh, can I borrow a guitar pick? Can I borrow a guitar <laughs> chord? Do you have a guitar strap? Never gave it back. And then she gets her, she gets her, um, what was that first book? The, the sex book. Yep. She's naked everywhere. Even so invited well. to that party at Industria. I still remember it like it was yesterday because a lot yeah. of things happened to me at that party. And I walk over to her, right in front of the cameras. I go, can I have my guitar picked back and my guitar cord and my fucking guitar strap? I've been sitting in my studio waiting for this shit right in front of the press. She's like, ah! And that, but that night I met Naomi Campbell when she was 24 years old. And I ended up going to Africa with her. Which oh, was wow. pretty wild. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, you know, you could go out and, you know, you can just like you, 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 everybody was accessible. Right. Right. They were there and they were on the dance floor. They weren't, you know, cloistered away in the VIP room. They nope. were there to dance. And, and Madonna would show up and dance and, and go up to the DJ booth and play her latest music and see if it got people moving. And the supermodels, it was the era of the supermodels and they were in the clubs. And, yep. and that's what it was about. It was like a primordial slime of creativity where just people. Oh, I love that. Together. Primordial slime of creativity. Wow. <laughs> it really did was. You like, did, you like write a little, did you write a little note before you came on the air? I'm going to use this line, primordial slime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's kind of my saying for the clubs of the 90s. Um, it was really a, a a breeding ground. It was, it was the, all of the elements. It was fucking life. fun, Steve. It was <laughs> fucking fun. Yeah. I'm telling you. Uh, it was like, I, you know, we don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> and that's what's missing from all this, man. We need we need this again, you know? And it's like we don't have it. Your camera's black. I'm real. <laughs> what's going on with my... There I go. 
There you're back. Coming back, I'm back. <laughs> no, we, we, we just don't have this anymore, and we need it badly. Um, yeah, we do. And you photographed our future president. Did you have a fucking <laughs> clue that Donald Trump had a Never crass, in a million years would I think that he would ever be the president. The crass, arrogant Donald yeah. Trump. The man who never right. pays his bills. The man who had a different <laughs> fucking, you know, the man who liked to grab them by the pussy. What was that like photographing him? Um, you know, he was a camera whore. I mean, he never met a camera he didn't like. And if you if he was across the room and you had a camera and you went like this, he would walk towards you to get his picture taken. So he, even from the very earliest days, he knew how to work the media. And, you know, he the picture I have him, of him in the book, he's like trolling the VIP room with like some burly security guards with his thumbs in his, you know, in his belt. Um, but, you know, he was a New York fixture. He was out at everything. And I never, ever would think of him as president. Like, I thought of him, like, jokingly running for president for his own publicity. But I never thought enough people would vote for him. Did Donald make. ever tell you not to publish a photo? <laughs> Never, no. He, yeah. he he wanted the publicity. <laughs> In fact, I, I have a funny story from when the debates were going on with Hillary Clinton, and um, she she brought up Alicia Machado and the fat shaming when she Alicia Machado was uh, Miss Universe and he was right. running the Miss Universe pattern or right. Miss America, whichever one. And she gained weight after she won. So he did a press conference at a gym, like a photo call. And he's like, I'll give her a chance to work her way down and wait. And we all took pictures of her at that press conference. And, you know, over the years, I scanned photos and put them in Getty to sell them. And I remember scanning those photos of Trump and Alicia Machado and thinking, these are never going to sell. I don't even know <laughs> why I'm scanning these. I'm wasting my time. So fast Boy, forward. Were you wrong. <laughs> fast forward another 10 or 15 years, and I'm watching the debate, and Hillary Clinton wow. says, Alicia Machado. And I go, yeah. I knew, the minute she said that. I, I, you know, I refreshed I my Google and there she was. It was like my photo, my photo, my photo, my photo. And for like three it, weeks man. after that, all it. over Latin America, all over TV, newspapers, magazines, Steve Eichner, Steve Eichner. And, you know, every time <laughs> it gets published, I make a sale. So, oh my yeah. God, that's great. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the great Steve Eichner, the man who's seen it all in the library. Tell us what book, what's the publisher? It's Penguin Books. It's Penguin Random House. Uh, it's it's called Prestel. It's their art book division. And, and I want to find out, it? huh? Where can they buy the book? The book can, is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Support your local bookstores. You can also get signed uh, copies of the book through my website, which is in dash the dash limelight dot com. So in the limelight with great. that. No, we'll put that on words. the screen. Yep, that's great. And uh, I want to thank Gabriel Sanchez, the writer, great guy, discovered it. We put this together together, J.L. Sturmer, my agent, and New Leaf, and um, Prestel, and Penguin Random House, and Holly Ledoux for bringing us on to Prestel and their family, and Jesse Yu, and your show, and much health and love and life to you. Yeah, man. Friend. You rock, Steve Eichner. You Thank rock. You. <laughs> well, I'll see you back at the mega clubs. Let's All open right, the mega club. Thanks New York needs it. Thanks for coming on, baby. Thanks for coming on. Great show. All, All right, right. To be continued. So much fun. All right. See you later. Peace.